odds of going to the moon uh, successfully with 1969 equipment, which had never been used before, was like 0.001% chance, meaning there was a 99.99% chance that they were going to kill the crew if they attempted to go to the moon. In fact, no aviation endeavor has ever worked on the first occasion. There's never been a new aircraft that rolled out that got off the ground the first time. The 747 was developed with 10 years better technology than Apollo after millions of aircraft had been built for 70 years. And it still took 168 attempts to get that fuselage off the ground. Even the Wright brothers, motorized kite, did not get off the ground the first time. So the idea that this lunar lander that had never been used before would work on the first occasion, that would be unprecedented. And so it's interesting that the only time an untried piece of flying equipment ever worked on the first occasion was the most complicated one of all time. Double contradictory, you see. And so that kind of planted a seed in my mind. Oh, I never thought about this. So I went back to those pictures, which I had seen 3,650 times every day of the year for 10 years with uh, open eyes and with a you know more critical perspective. And sure enough, you could see where the real soil ended and the fake backdrops began. Because in the original prints that I got, and if you can find a book on eBay from the late 60s, early 70s of the Apollo program, uh, the pictures look different. NASA has since color corrected them because they're fake and they're trying to cover up their mistakes. But the soil in the original pictures was a caramel brown, as it really is. That's the way it appears in the Chinese probes, which I believe are genuine. And then the backdrops were this grayish blue. So it became pretty distinctive where the real soil ended and the fake backdrops began. Since then, NASA has put a filter over them and re-photographed them so that the soil is grayish blue to match the grayish blue background. So that kind of planted a seed in my mind. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Never thought of that. Another 10 years forward, I'm 24. I'm now a professional filmmaker. So my job as a filmmaker is to make fake scenes look real. So all the more I start looking at these pictures and I can not only tell they were lit with electrical lighting, which wouldn't be necessary in sunlight on the moon, which is 20 times brighter sun with no atmosphere, right? I can tell you what kind of light they're using. They're using an umbrella light, which I have in my closet to bounce the light off of an umbrella first and then, you know, put them on the subject so it's not as harsh, fill light. And it's clearly that's what they're using if you're a filmmaker. And then, of course, they have shadows that should be parallel in sunlight from objects five feet apart. I mean, just go outside on a bright, sunny day, look at two trees, two telephone poles, or you and a friend standing five feet apart, and your shadows will always run parallel, never intersect. It's impossible for them to intersect. And we have pictures. I can do a screen share and show you from Apollo 17, allegedly the last mission to the moon, where an astronaut shadow is going at 12 o'clock and a rock five feet away is going at nine o'clock. I mean, that's 90 degree intersection of shadows from objects five feet apart. This cannot be duplicated in sunlight, which means it's not sunlight, which means it's electrical light, which means they're on Earth. You can prove scientifically and legally in a court of law that the moon landings are fake from one NASA photograph of the shadows intersecting at 90 degrees. All you got to do is take a jury outside in sunlight and say, look, they're parallel and they always will be and they all, you know, always are. So, and then you go turn off, you bring a light into the uh, courtroom, turn off all the lights except one electrical light. And if you stand on one side of it, the shadows at 12 o'clock, stand on the other side of it, it's at nine o'clock. You just prove very simple that the moon pictures are fake which means they didn't go to the moon so when i'm 24 as a filmmaker i actually am editing a film one day for the man who produced the show i saw 10 years earlier as a 14 year old with the guy on it who said we didn't go to the moon and i'm like well, what is his name i'd like to talk to him he says i don't remember call the san francisco office i did they said they were days away 
from deleting all 10 year old archives to make room for other videotapes because they're broadcast videotapes pretty big back in the day. So I call him up. He says, you're a filmmaker. Why don't you make a movie about how the moon landings were fraudulent? And I said, well, let me think about it. So I do even more research and find out numerous inconsistencies, not only with the pictures, with just behavior. For example, the chief administrator of NASA, James Webb, resigned days before the first Apollo mission without explanation. You would think he'd want to be a part of this great accomplishment, didn't want to have anything to do with it. Then two of the three astronauts on the first mission rarely give interviews unless the president personally asked them to, right? So two of the three people in the greatest event in human history don't want to talk about it. And then if you look at their faces during their one and only press conference, you, you, they look like they're at the funeral of their mother not the winning locker room of the Super Bowl. Then you have the fact that the Soviets were the first to put a satellite in space, the first to put an animal in space, the first to put a man in space, the first to do a spacewalk, the first to do two spacecrafts at the same time. For every 10 hours we spent in space, they spent 50 hours. And they never once tried to go to the moon. Isn't that weird? And then but you can prove it. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I've got a question about uh, the Soviets. Um, why haven't the Soviets called the Americans out on the moon landing being a hoax? Well, because they're blackmailing them. I mean, it, it's not a coincidence that during the Nixon administration's Apollo program, that Nixon one week said Russia's our greatest enemy, them in China, and the very next week he agrees to sell them billions of dollars worth of grain below cost. And then look at China. China, he said, was the biggest enemy. And then during the Apollo program, he goes over there and kisses their butt and off and opens trade relations with them. They're blackmailing him. I personally know someone who works in command center at the Chinese space agency would just put probes on the moon. He told me face to face Everyone in China space agency knows the missions are fake. However, they have an agreement with NASA not to say so in exchange for technology. They're being blackmailed. You know, I could have a picture of a world leader with a prostitute and upload it to the Internet and bring him down. And then, then it's not worth anything, is it? Or if I'm smart, like the Chinese and Russians are, I could blackmail them year after year, 10 million, then 20 million, then 50 million. You see what I'm saying? And that's what they're doing. So first of all, you can prove it with one photograph, which I can screen share and show you the side-by-side -side comparison. Secondly, you can prove it with logic. Okay, today, with 50 years better technology, the farthest that NASA can send an astronaut into space is to the space station, which is 250 miles above the Earth. So just pick some place 250 miles away from London, make it vertical, and that's as far as they can go. That's why there's mannequins orbiting the moon on Artemis and not people, because the radiation would kill them, right? So what they're really saying is that when all of NASA combined had one millionth the computing power of a cell phone, they sent astronauts a thousand times farther than they can today with 50 years better technology. You, you can't have greater technology, a thousand times greater technology in the past and in the future. That's a historic and scientific impossibility. So you just proved it through logic right there that the moon missions were fake. That you can't have greater technology in the past Therefore, it was a forgery. I mean, it's that simple. When Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic in 1927, imagine 50 years later, no one can do it. Oh, well, no. You know, five years later, people were doing it. Ten years later, thousands of people were doing it. And aircraft, hundreds of times more complicated. Ten years after they blew up the first atomic bomb in 1945, atomic bombs were one thousand times more powerful so if they could go to the moon on the first attempt with 1960s one millionth of computing power cell phone technology 
we would have been on Mars 10 years later. We'd be in another solar system by now, and there'd be bases all over the moon. The idea that they have to return to the moon a seventh time to rehearse going to Mars, that's what they keep saying. George Bush Jr. said out of his own mouth, we have to return to the moon as a logical first step to going to Mars and beyond. Well, I thought they already did it six times. Imagine we've been to the North Pole six times, but never the South Pole, and we're going to go to the North Pole the seventh time before we go to the South Pole the first time. NASA is saying the same thing. There's the administrator of NASA says we have to go to the moon to practice going to Mars. We did that 50 years ago. Why are we going from a bicycle back to a tricycle? Unless we never actually rode the tricycle, you see? So you can prove it there. Now, I made a movie. First of all, let me continue the story. I originally turned down this project. After, after seeing all this weird stuff, I'm like, it looks like maybe they did fake it. And if they did, you know, overturning these rocks could be hazardous to my health. So I'm not going to risk my life for something Richard Nixon did. No, thank you. About five years go by, and I was challenged by another client to do them a favor if they got a script of mine to a famous Hollywood producer. And I said, what favor? They said, read the Bible. They were Christian musicians. So I got a one-year Bible divided into 365 calendar reads. And over the next five years, I read the Bible five times. Now, I wasn't a Christian by any means, but it did develop in me a conviction of right and wrong and that it makes sense that there's a judgment for how you live your life and it makes sense you can just see it rape and murder are wrong child molestation are wrong politicians saying they're going to do something and not doing it is wrong and so there is a struggle between good and evil and this is the greatest accomplishment of mankind it has spiritual symbolism especially when Richard Nixon, who knew they were not on the moon, said putting a man on the moon is the greatest event since God created the universe. Pretty gutsy, huh? And so what you have here is two possibilities. Either they went to the moon or they did. Now, I know for a fact they didn't, which means, in my opinion, not going to the moon, claiming you did, putting it in encyclopedias on coins and in stamps when it's not true, holding ticker tape parades for them, embezzling $200 billion, murdering people to keep it a secret, giving them medals of honor for being such good liars. If that's true, which it is, that's actually more historically significant than if they had actually gone. Do you see that? The faking of the moon landing is more profound of an event to mankind than if they'd actually gone. And then I realized if this is true, which I found out it was, then this is a historical truth that mankind is being robbed from. We're, we cannot advance, right? You really can't go to Mars until you go to the moon first. That's a fact. That's why they're going to the moon again for the first time. And we really can't advance as a species unless we admit that our greatest accomplishment was a lie. George Orwell said, whoever controls the past, the moon landings are real, when they certainly weren't, controls the future, which means the criminals and their entities and their offspring who are running the government, unless they admit that the moon missions were fake, they will remain corrupt for all time. It's extremely important historically for the truth about the moon landing fraud to come out. It's not a theory. It's a fact that they faked it. Shadows can't intersect in sunlight. You can't have a thousand times greater space traveling technology 50 years ago than today. And then after I decided to make the movie, I changed my mind. I called up Bill Case and I said, I changed my mind. Days later, serendipitously, I meet a millionaire who builds rockets for NASA, who knows the moon missions are fake. He gives me a million dollars to produce these movies proving it because he thinks it is morally wrong that they did it and they're either going to have to keep lying or kill people who naively think they can go to the moon on the first attempt with 1960s technology five decades later elon musk tried to land a rocket vertically like they claim they did six times on the moon 
He had six computers surrounding that rocket. Each computer was 100 million times more powerful than the lunar lander computer, and he had six of them. The first time he tried to land that rocket vertically with all that extra computing power, it blew up. The second time he tried to land vertically, it blew up. The third time he tried to land vertically, it blew up. The fourth time, it blew up. The fifth time he was able to do it. So how could they do it with 100th millionth the computing power 50 years ago on the first attempt? So we start producing this seven-year film called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon which you can see for free at sabrell.com. You just go to my last name, S as in Sam, I, B as in boy, R-E-L, sabrell.com. And I have 16 links for my new book, which just came out, which is the backstory about my investigation into this, which also reveals a deathbed confession of an eyewitness who was there when they filmed the faking of the moon landing. So the book is interactive. I read it in audio or it's a Kindle in print. And I say, like, read a chapter, now stop, go to video link one. Read a chapter, video link two, and so forth. Well, go to sabrell.com, click on Moonman video links, top left corner, click on link two, a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. And you will see footage we uncovered, classified footage of outtakes from a special effects shot of the first mission to the moon. At the beginning of the reel, it says, do not show to the public. I asked for unedited footage, but I didn't get any, except this and one other reel. For an hour, they are using a one-foot model of the Earth, pretending it's the Earth floating in space as if the camera's at the window looking back at them halfway to the moon. It's dated two days into the flight. There's a third track of audio of the CIA telling them how to fake a four second radio delay because they never left earth orbit. If I said hello, they would say hello back immediately because they're only 250 miles away, but they're supposed to be 130,000 miles away. So they estimated two seconds out, two seconds back. We have the audio of the CIA telling them only to speak after four seconds go by. It's clear as crystal on the tape. And so we have third proof. First shadows intersecting, which proves it. You can't have greater technology in the past, which proves it. And now we uncovered classified footage of fake photography. I showed it to the news director at NBC News where I worked. He collapsed in his chair, put his hand over his mouth and said, oh my gosh, this absolutely proves they never left Earth orbit. They never went to the moon. I said, yeah, what do we do? He said, I cannot broadcast this. It'll cause a civil war. I will not go down to history as the man who caused the next civil war, which he was indirectly saying is if we show the public how corrupt their federal government is, they will be so mad it'll bring an end to the corrupt federal government. Isn't that a good thing? I don't think he realized that. Ten years go by. I show the same footage, which you can see for free at sabrell.com, that convinces four out of five people who previously thought the moon missions are real that it's fake. And I, I, another news director at NBC discovered it 10 years later. They said, this proves we didn't go to the moon. We're going to broadcast this nationwide. Breaking news. They flew me to New York City. They put me up in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. They gave me thousands of dollars for the exclusive rights to broadcast this footage in my interview. They got a call from the federal government. Don't do it. And they backed down. I hate to say it, gentlemen, but the BBC did the same thing. They saw the footage. They said this proves it didn't go to the moon. We're going to do a surprise broadcast. Grab people's attention. Prove the moon landings were fake. Three days beforehand, they pulled the plug, threatening phone call from the United States. Then it gets better. After my film comes out, as I'm editing my book, kind of the backstory. Now, there are things in the book that are not in the movie, including the murder of Apollo astronauts. And this isn't my opinion. This is the opinion of the dead astronauts' relatives. Okay, who I interviewed for hours. The man who would have been, who was scheduled to be the first man on the moon, 
was murdered by the CIA because he wouldn't cooperate. Not my opinion. It's the opinion of the dead man's widow. And it's the opinion of the dead man's son, who's a 747 pilot, who I interviewed for seven hours. They asked me not to put it in the film, but I could put it in my book. Their husband, Betty, told me on January 26, 1967, came home from work at NASA and said, Hun, for some strange reason, for the first time ever, the CIA is all over the launch pad. I wonder why. The next day, the guy's dead. Because days earlier, he held a press conference without permission, where he took a bunch of reporters up to the very top of the rocket where he affixed a lemon the size of a grapefruit and called the piece of equipment to go to the moon by the first man to fly there, a piece of junk. Days later, he dies the day after the CIA shows up to NASA. You see? So it'd be one thing if they faked the moon landing and didn't kill anybody. Then you'd kind of respect their cleverness. Hey, they tunneled under from the dry cleaner into the bank and got the gold. Good for them. Not if they kill three people who are fathers, husbands at the same time, you see. And when our first document of the country is the Declaration of Independence, which says when any government becomes destructive of the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, well, we have proof right there. They took away the life of their own people to cover up their crimes. And then they're taking away liberty. You have to ask permission to open your business, permission to go to school, permission to go to church, permission to go to the beach, or you'll be arrested. That's slavery, not liberty. And then the pursuit of happiness. What if it's your happiness to go to the beach or your happiness to open your business? They are not our masters. A long time, 200 years ago, they were called public servants. Now they're masters. It's not the right of one person who's just an equal human being to me to tell me when I can or cannot open my business. If they want to advise me against the risk, that's okay. I'll take your advice or not. They're no better than me. So if one person can tell another person that they can't open their business, then that's slavery, right? I don't care if four out of five people are dropping dead. It's still the decision of the owner of the business whether or not to open their business and take that risk. It's still the individual's decision whether they want to go shopping or stay at home under those circumstances. They're not our parents. They're not our babysitter. They're not our jail keepers. What is quarantining? That's jail. They're putting people under house arrest. There was a president in France who got caught you know, taking bribes and he was under, quote, house arrest. You mean I'm being treated like someone who's a criminal? For, for what? Be, be because there might be a danger going outside? I did a statistical study. Even if the, the boogie germ is true, you, are, you have a greater chance of dying in a car crash on the way to work than you do from catching a fatal virus at work. So I guess we need to make all cars illegal. We need to just ban cars. No one can ever drive ever again for their own protection, right? So the government is beyond corrupt. So as I'm editing this book, I'm put in touch with a gentleman by the name of Cyrus Eugene Akers. Well, Cyrus Eugene Akers was the chief of security at Cannon Air Force Base in 1968. And as he's dying, you know what he told his son? He said, you know, I'm about to meet God. God, forgive me. I'm a murderer. I murdered somebody. He said he murdered a co-worker because he and the co-worker, I witnessed a government secret. And his friend said he was going to tell the world because he thought what they were doing was morally wrong. He said the reason why he killed this person was to cover up the moon landing fraud, which was filmed at Cannon Air Force Base June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1968. He stood beside President Johnson the first day of filming, who just couldn't help but wanted to take a look at it. And sure enough, according to Johnson's schedule, he was on holiday one hour flight away. And Cannon Air Force Base, before this was being investigated, 
boasted on their website. President Johnson visited us in 1968. They since took it down since we started digging into this. And President Johnson gave the chief of security at Cannon Air Force Base, which, by the way, is the headquarters of the United States Air Force's Intelligence and Special Ops Division. It's not Area 51. Every branch of the military, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force, they all have their special ops headquarters. It's at Cannon Air Force Base, the very place where the moon landings were filmed June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1968. Do you know how many government employees were involved in it? Do you have an estimate of how many were involved? Yeah, we know exactly. We know their names. I published them in my book. Uh, President Johnston gave Cyrus Eugene Akers a list of 15 people who were allowed in to observe this, and only these people. Mind you, Cyrus Eugene Akers was the chief of security at the most secure Air Force base, and potentially the most secure base in the in the country, and the military, because that's where they chose to film it. And so President Johnson said these 15 people are allowed in to eyewitnesses and nobody else. He kept the list. He gave it to his son who gave it to me and I published it in the book. And so we know who was there and some of these people are still alive. And a couple of good guy uh, friends of mine, actually, when I was editing the book before it was published, asked me to call two people on that list of 15 people. And I was, you know, reluctant to do that, as you might imagine. You know, it'd be different after my book was published, but to do it before, I was taking a great chance. They said, you know, we got your back. And and one of the chapters in my book is called The Funny Thing Happened on the Way to CNN. Because when I found, and I've never talked about this publicly, okay, but when I found classified footage of fake photography, you know, my phones were disconnected. My cars were tampered with. I was followed from church in the middle of the night. I made my way to CNN to give to a reporter there. I was literally surrounded by government agents in the back alley of CNN who confiscated the tape. It was a copy, gave me truth serum to the point of vomiting, asked me a series of questions. A lawyer happened to have an office in the back alley of CNN. If he didn't, I might not be here today to tell you the story, you know. And so I escaped their custody. I made my way back to Nashville where I lived. I peed in a cup. I said, I got him. I got true serum in me. <laughs> no, no, nobody but the CIA would have this. So I, pee, I peed in a cup. I gave it to a friend to put in a lab in his name, not mine. And a few days later when we met, I said, well, what are the results? He says, well, there was a problem at the lab. And I'm, yeah, what problem? He says, well, funny thing. They had a break in over the weekend. And I'm like, so he said, well, funny thing. The only thing stolen was your urine sample. So this is the type of thing that is in the book that I've never talked about publicly. And so is this deathbed confession. So I call up two of these people on the list, right? This is less than two years ago. One of them is Eugene Krantz, former flight director of Apollo. He said something odd. He answers the phone without even saying hello. I'm looking at the counter on the phone and he doesn't say anything. I'm thinking, well, maybe the call didn't go through. I call back again. He says, is this tech support for the satellite comm video call I'm having with Cernan? Apparently, these guys have scrambled, you know, military grade video conferencing equipment in their house uh, during their retirement to talk to each other about their secrets, right? Well, a little side note, it had to be Eugene Cernan because he's, you know, Eugene Krantz, flight director. And if he's having a call with Cernan, it has to be Eugene Cernan, Apollo 17 astronaut, who allegedly died two years earlier. <laughs> so I guess that guy's still alive. After all, he didn't want to deal with the 50th anniversary fallout, right? So, and then I call another guy on the list I'd never heard of, but I was asked to call him. So I did. I say, hey, I've got you on this list at Cannon Air Force Base. Uh, and he, you know, hangs up immediately. Then a couple of days later, the son of Cyrus Eugene Akers, his house was broken into and everything about his father's confiscated. And then a couple of days 
later, less than two years ago, government agents show up and tell him face to face, if he ever talks to me again, they'll kill him and his family. You see, this is very serious. This is not a theory they didn't go to the moon. It's an absolute fact. I've been drugged. I've been followed. I've been kidnapped. And murders have taken place. We know for a fact that the crew of Apollo 1, that's three people murdered. We know that Cyrus Eugene Akers killed a person. That's four people murdered. We know that there were four other backup crews, uh, members of backup crews that died in accidents within 24 months of each other. Then we have uh, James Irwin, Apollo uh, 15 astronaut who called up Bill Casey of his own initiative. And he had something to get off his chest about the moon landing, about his book, saying it was fraudulent. He said, I'm concerned for my safety. Call me at this number on this day, three days from now. The astronaut coincidentally had a fatal heart attack on that day. So there's another one, right? That's so far nine Apollo astronauts. After the Boston massacre, which killed five people, our founding fathers and mother says, that's it enough we're going to risk our lives our property everything because this is morally wrong robert mcnamara defense secretary during the vietnam war admitted on his deathbed that the pearl harbor incident that got everyone fired up to join the vietnam war the alleged attack of a north vietnamese on an american ship it never happened they made it up that led to the death of 58,220 americans so I think if they're willing to kill all these people, they're willing to fake an image on a television. The, uh, unlike, though, 9-11 and JFK, because whoever did those things, those people are still dead. This is a positive lie. This is taking candy away from the public and giving them a turd. And, st and this is what the news director saw. He said this will enrage people, right? It's kind of odd we have this you know, detailed information, deathbed confession, where the moon landing was filmed, Cannon Air Force Base, when it was filmed, June 1st, 2nd, 3rd of 1968, a list of 15 people who were there, one of which wrote in his own autobiography that he was there at the time for a classified reason. We have the code name, Slam Dunk. President Johnson personally came up with it. He said, we can guarantee a successful mission if we fake it, Therefore, it's a slam dunk, you see. And yet the top two podcasters in America have not interviewed me about this breaking information, because if it comes out, if it's finally confirmed that the moon missions were indeed falsified. I think the public is going to be mad. I think they're going to find out that the government is murdering their own people, because the very next thing they're going to have to investigate is the Apollo one crew's homicide by the CIA, which their relatives have been saying for decades, was the government murdering their own people. They're taking away life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which means they need to be altered or abolished, right?